Thank you, Martina, and thank you to all the organizers and to all of you that are watching from all over the world. I'm going to talk today about the headache that, as a curator, I've been proud to give Peter Oleksik, who will speak later on today, and many other of my beloved conservator colleagues at the Museum of Modern Art. And uh, I will touch on uh, both physical digital design and also digital digital design, just to let you know a little bit of the evolution of the role of digital at MoMA in the past few years. I've been at MoMA for, at this point, 28 years, so it's a really long time. And, uh, you know, it's really, oh, first I have to share and then I start. Okay. It's always a little bit laborious when we have to move from the uh, focus to the slideshow. So the collection of MoMA is pretty much like this, you know, on the one hand, you know, beautiful Hoffman stools from the beginning of the century that need a certain type of restoration. And on the other hand, instead, the honeypop Tokujinyo Shioka chair that, that needs a different type of restoration. You can see that chair with the imprint, you know, you open it up like a Chinese lantern, then you sit on it and it acquires the imprint of your butt. So you can see my own butt there. But this slide is just to talk about the extreme complexity of the work of a conservator at MoMA. And uh, today I'm going to basically make uh, a keynote that introduces the work of these heroic colleagues. Before that, I would like to give a little introduction about the role of digital at MoMA. This masterpiece that you see in front of you is the first website for MoMA, 1995. And it was coded by yours truly, because at that time, MoMA didn't really know what a website was. And when I asked for it, they didn't know who would need to sign off and how much to give me. So they gave me a budget of $315 that I used to take how to dinner, um, a graduate student of the School of Visual Arts who taught me HTML and who helped me code it. So here it is in all its glory. You can still find it in the website of the Museum of Modern Art if you look for mutant materials in contemporary design. But the interesting part of this is that it was one of the first uses of digital at MoMA to think of archiving. So the reason why I wanted this website and other curators after me wanted that website was to have the checklist in a reliable place where everybody could access it. At that time, we could only have very little, um, very little images, of course, but still it was a document. And because it was in HTML and not in Flash as many other websites that came later, it is still there, still alive and kicking and still accessible to all. So that was one of of the very first application and many more came. You know, after this website, the museum opened its own official website. Many other colleagues had ancillary websites. Then the MoMA website started, the rest is history. But I would like to move to uh, many years later, another wonderful application of digital in curatorial work. I'm showing tools to you right now. And this beautiful tool was in Leah Dickerman's exhibition, Inventing Abstraction, uh, that happened in 2012. For that exhibition, Leah asked our colleagues in digital design to create a network map of all the different influences in abstraction at the beginning of the 20th century. It was a groundbreaking way to update a very famous map of, uh, uh, of modern art that Alfred Barr had designed by hand in the middle of the 20th century. So all of a sudden, digital al allows curators to present more complex designs and more complex histories. And uh, to show you another curatorial application of digital is the work, is the project design and violence that I started in 2014 at MoMA after getting a rejection for a physical exhibition that would explore the, the different manifestations of violence in contemporary society. Understandably, MoMA decided that maybe it was not a good idea to have an exhibition of Kalashnikovs and self-guided bullets. And so my co-curator, Jamer Hunt, and I decided to 
to migrate to a WordPress site without asking for anybody's money and permission. And then after a while, MoMA embraced it in its own website and even published a book. But what was beautiful as a curatorial practice in this particular kind of project was that Jamer and I were able to have a real dialogue with our, uh, with our audience. Not only were we able to ask for authoritative small essays about each one of the single objects that we would present, but at the end of each essay, we were able to ask a question of the audience. Questions like serious questions like, uh, will the natural violence of nature eventually be co-opted in human conflict? Like, will we fight like animals? Is execution always ugly? Can we create, can we redesign a violent act to be more humane? And the, the conversations were amazing. For one particular post, which was about the redesign of the slaughterhouse by Temple Granding to make it more uh, palatable to human beings, we had 150 comments, something that we would never have been able to have in a physical gallery. So this idea of curatorial life in all dimensions is something that remained with us also when we started acquiring digital objects. We acquired digital objects of all kind. I will get to the 3D objects, 3D printed objects at the end of my presentation, but I wanted to give you <clears throat> more of a gallery of other examples. We acquired visualization design, especially starting with the 2008 exhibition Design and the Elastic Mind, and then in 2011 with the exhibition Talk to Me. And this is just one example. It's the uh, wind map by Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg that you can still find online accessible to all that shows using official meteorological measurements at any time uh, shows the, the, the movement of the winds over the territory of the United States in lifetime. And um, this in, inserts one of the big first issues of uh, digital collections. How do you collect a live exhibition? How do you collect something that is happening in the world anytime? And we will discuss those legal issues later on. But I think that our general counsels in many institutions have had a ball, a hard time, but also a lot of fun in the past few years. Another complex um, uh, exhibition that inserts a new problem in our, in our discussion is this exhibition of reactive books by John Maida. John Maida was one of the first people to try transform interaction and interface design into art. And these are mini apps that can be uh, that can be manipulated by visitors through different input devices from keyboards to actually uh, from big or small keyboards to actually joysticks, but they have to play on a certain type of computer, at least at the beginning. It's a choice. John says that he would be neutral, that it would be okay to have contemporary screens, but as curators, we try to also find the right hardware, something that my colleague um, in uh, my colleagues in performance and media always have a really hard time with, to the point that there are actually companies that are manufacturing old cathodic tube monitors in order to play the art of a few years ago. We also acquired digital fonts, and even in that case, really interesting. What do you acquire? Do you acquire the files? And this introduces us to another main issue that is the, in the end user license agreement and how to negotiate it in order to have an exhibition or an object in the collection that is permanently there, even though it is still subjected to an end user license agreement. And you'll see afterwards, you know, I can tell you now that we don't have any Apple fonts because Apple was not amenable to change that EULA. And the same happens when I will talk to you about collecting video games with Nintendo. And we also acquired, this was really funny, the, the, the um, relationship, the, the, the conversation with general counsel with Nancy Adelson in particular, when we acquired the at sign. And she said, well, Paula, thank God, this is not a video game. And this is not legally challenging, even though it, intellectual, it is intellectually challenging. So you see here some of the acquisitions, the on off sign, the at sign, which is completely in the public domain. So it includes a new kind of complexity or the Google, Google map pin sign. 
We even acquired, and this is something that makes biodesign close to architecture, we acquired the physical 3D printed representation of a virus that was created using software by Adobe Systems. So you see that digital really pervades all of our different parts of the collection. But it is the applied design exhibition in 2013 that in a way gives you a sense of the digital at MoMA. Applied design meant that design can be applied to all dimensions, physical, metaphysical, digital, and that it is still a form of design where the code takes the place of, say, plastics, resin, or wood. It was an exhibition that had many of the video games that are now in our collection and also many of our 3D printed objects. You see here a vision of some of the video games together with the wind map and here is like a little bit more of an overview of the video games that are in our collection and you see also here some of our 3D printing and that's really what I will focus on right now. We started collecting 3D printed at the end of the, at the beginning, I'm sorry, of the 21st century with the first examples coming out of, in particular, one manufacturer in Belgium called MGX. And uh, we uh, had examples that were made in resins and that still were very expensive because the vats to produce that kind of 3D printing had to be very big and were available only in certain places in the world. We acquired the work of Patrick Jouin, the, the, the one-shot stool. We acquired works in which a video, the continuous digital file were stopped at different stills and the still was then sent to a 3D printer that would print it ad hoc in, in, a, in a, an infinite number of possibilities. We acquired that beautiful wooden table by de Makersban in which handcraft would be uh, mixed with 3D cutting and, and laser cutting in which you, know, you would see a Rococo piece of furniture's profile turn into a Louis XIV by using digital cutting that then would allow the slices to be put together by hand. And we acquired the work by Joris Larman that was using um, a special program that was developed for the car industry in Germany, Opel in particular, that would simulate what nature would do if given a certain set of forces, it had to develop branches or bones. And you see it here, this beautiful uh, chair in aluminum. Design in the Elastic Mine in 2008 was another big occasion to acquire works that were 3D printed. And as you know very well, there's many different kinds of 3D printed, but laser sintering in particular had a big moment at that time and enabled our conservators to start thinking of how to maintain those particular materials. There are also other examples of 3D printing in the collection that I'm proud of. This is Markus Kaiser that invented a 3D printer that uses desert sand and beams of sun to then center it. So you see here a little vessel that is made using sand of the Sahara Desert, and it gives you this uh, vessel that is at the same time timeless, could have been designed and manufactured millennia ago, but at the same time, it's very timely because the, the characteristic veins uh, that are typical of laser sintering or light sintering are present in it. It's a challenge for our conservator because it has a certain friability, but still, you know, it's uh, what would life be if we didn't have to like give trouble to our colleagues every now and then. More recently, we have been acquiring objects that are uh, very pragmatic, you know, 3D printing, as you know, very well can be a tool to experiment in an almost artistic way or conceptual way, or it can be very pragmatic. 3D printing is has been used in the medical industry and the automobile industry for decades. And now it is also being used for um, you know, such, um, such uh, examples as replenishing the coral reef in the ocean by 3D printing ceramics, uh, trellises that can then be seeded with some, um, with some real little pieces of coral and then put into the ocean so that they can actually replenish the coral reef in uh, a few decades. So these are some of the most recent acquisitions and I don't think that they will create too much trouble for our conservator colleagues. They are from the exhibition Broken Nature. 
from the same broken nature come also new different types of 3D printing. For instance, this beautiful work from the algae platform in Arles, whereby um, the, uh, this particular lab is teaching many people all over the world to harness the byproduct of our pollution, which is the algae that have proliferated everywhere, and with a few chemical processes, transform them into bioplastics that can then be 3D printed into vessels coming from the material culture of that particular place. You know, so it really is amazing how, how, it, how interesting 3D printing can be in also trying to replenish the culture of a particular place. They have already had experiments that happened in Arles with some contemporary Dutch designers, but then they also worked at it in Istanbul and they worked on material culture from Turkey into making these beautiful vessels. It's almost like a fab lab. You might remember the media lab and the fab labs of the beginning of the 21st century when they were thinking that 3D printing machines could be deployed all over the world with these portable labs that could work with solar energy and be also used all over the African continent, for instance, or other parts of the world that were not reached by electricity and help people locally build their own tools. So it's really the same kind of instinct that happened before that is now pursued by many designers and engineers with the same passion, but in different uh, forms with different materials more resistant materials and in different parts of the world. The recent exhibition, Mary Oxman <clears throat> Material Ecology, gave us new types of 3D printing and new types of applications of materials that create new challenges. The whole idea be behind Mary Oxman's work is to merge human intervention, robotics and computation and natural agents such as silkworms to create together a new type of architecture and design that is grown instead of built. And of course, that is perishable. Actually, in some cases, the <clears throat> the perishability is built within the materials. You see here the beautiful silk pavilion that she designed for the exhibition. It was a new commission for MoMA, but behind it in the big wall, you see a series of say uh, of materials that can be 3D printed. They use pectin and other naturally available uh, matters that have a, a, a prescribed form of perishability. So you can build a life cycle within the material. Neri worked very closely with several 3D printing labs to experiment on new types of printing using different materials. She was among the first back in 2008 to actually 3D print with three different plastics. And more recently, she has been able to incorporate also live bacteria in the work that she's doing and even melanin. You see at the bottom right, a new prototype of work that uses melanin. The idea is that in the future, we might be able to actually have facades of building that get darker as the light of the sun becomes stronger and therefore create a, a sustainability that is almost self-generated. Of course, it's about 3D printing the channels where melanin will flow. And at this point, it's still very prototypical, but it's something that she's really working on. And as you can see here from some of the pages of the catalog, her philosophy is clear. On the right-hand side, you have death masks, very beautiful, 3D printed using the bacteria or even the, uh, the flow of breath from the dying person. On the left-hand side, you see her experiments with silkworms and the pavilion that was installed at MoMA was developed using 17,500 live silkworms that then were left to die of their own death instead of being boiled as they usually are in the silk industry. So it was also uh, this idea of working together with the animals and working together with bacteria and viruses in a way that is as copacetic as possible. And this is perhaps the next challenge for my conservator colleagues. This was the video that people would see on 53rd Street as they were walking by. The exhibition, the Mary Oxman exhibition and also Broken Nature were in the galleries on the ground floor and were ways for people to really peek into a brand new world of materials. And the big video would give a sense of the materials that were behind the window. So it really is interesting 
interesting to see how far we've come and how challenging the work has become for museums. At the beginning, of course, there was almost like an arch. The materials for 3D printing at the beginning were very fragile and very light sensitive. They've become stronger and stronger and more and more resistant to any kind of uh, manipulation and exposure. But at the same time, designers have included and have inserted a new type of complexity, that of biology. We'll see that what the future will bring and as curators will be ready for it. Thank you very much. And I am now gonna stop sharing the screen and take your questions. <laughs>